You ever, you ever experienced hostility? Maybe you're coming through the, uh, the, uh, the holidays and you were with friends or family and you're thinking, man, if you could only know the stories. Uh, hopefully that's not the case. Hopefully you had a wonderful Christmas, no hostility. I'm thinking in particular about two work-related instances, just so you know that it's not about work here uh, at Bethel. These are previous jobs. And I'm not going to mention where, where I worked, but on one occasion, I remember this guy and I felt like he was always looking over my shoulder, seeking to, to just like nitpick what I was doing. And it created this really uncomfortable work environment. It wasn't very fun to go to work. I didn't enjoy it. Uh, on the other occasion, just this, this kind of negative, hostile kind of work environment. And it was, it was a bummer. It sucked the life out of me to go to work. I didn't enjoy it at all. I don't know if you can relate to that, but Uh, If you've ever experienced hostility, maybe it's from work, maybe it's from friends, maybe it's from family, somewhere in your life you've experienced it, it can can leave you kind of asking this question, what is going on around here? Like, why is this happening? What does this person have against me? And, And why, if you're a follower of Jesus, why is God allowing this? Why is God allowing this in my life? Because it would seem if, if we serve the God who, who created everything, and we do, and he sent his son to die on the cross for us, and he did, and he could control everything about the world, and he can, you would think maybe he would just kind of smooth that out. And yet, Jesus said this the night before he was crucified, He said, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember that I, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Hostility, especially for our faith, is part of the experience of the people of God. And we don't really understand it when we are experiencing it. It cannot kind of make us ask the question, God, what are you up to? Why are you doing that? It's kind of like we have this thing up here. You're probably, maybe you're, maybe you're not, maybe you haven't noticed it before. Uh, but we have this, you see this? It's white, this thing, it's white, this big, big white uh, thing. It's, it's a canvas. We're going to be painting on it as the sermon series goes. But have you ever seen a, uh, a painter, maybe like Bob Ross, you know, like the happy little trees guy? You know, he's, he's a little bit old. If, if you don't know who that is, you can look him up on YouTube later. He's got this big, big like, hair, the opposite of me. And uh, he, he makes things with, with interesting tools, and he makes little happy little trees. But, but he, a guy like that, they start out, these master artists, if you watch them, they start out, and often they'll just start with a blank canvas, and they'll just start doing stuff. And they'll choose a color, and they'll make a mark. And you have no idea where it's going to end up. At the end, it all comes together, but in the the very beginning, you're kind of asking that same question, what is going on here? This doesn't look like anything. And I want to use that as a metaphor as we look at the life of Joseph. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. Uh, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. It is the book of beginnings. So right, right at the beginning, this is on page, what page? About 31 in the Sanctuary Bibles. The word Genesis comes from a Greek word which literally means beginning. It's interesting, I'm, I'm doing my Bible reading this year through a, a, the complete Jewish study Bible. It's very interesting. It has a lot of uh, interesting background on the Jewish, uh, the Jewishness of the Bible. And, and so it has the, the books of the Bible in their Hebrew. And in Hebrew... Genesis is simply Bereshit, which doesn't mean anything to us because we don't speak Hebrew, but Bereshit literally is just the first word of the book of Genesis, which means in the beginning. Genesis is the book of beginnings, and there's, we've basically been taking it the last few years in chunks. We look at the first 11 chapters, and the first 11 chapters kind of look at the, the question, why is the world the way it is? We experience the world as both beautiful, don't we? And yet it's also broken. And how can those two things be together at the same time? And the book of Genesis answers that question. God created a beautiful, but it it was broken because man fell into sin. 
So it's both broken and beautiful. And then in Genesis 12, God chooses a man. This is God's plan to undo the brokenness of the world. He chooses a man. The man's name is Abraham, or Abram at the time. He's 75 years old, and he says to him, he says, I want you to leave everything that's familiar. I want to go to the land that I'm going to show you. And if you do, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and through you all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. He is childless. So God promises him a, a child. So he waits for 25 years. Abraham waits 25 years for God to fulfill his promise, if you can imagine. And then Isaac is born in fulfillment of God's promise. And then we get the Isaac story, and it's short. It's, it, it's amazing if you think about the Isaac story, because Isaac, everything, he'd, he'd been promised and longed for and thought about and, and dreamed about for 25 years, and then he gets here, and we get about two chapters on the life of Isaac. His life was a big, fat nothing on, on the blip. It was unimportant and, and unremarkable. Fascinating. And then we come to Jacob. And one of the amazing things we, we find, this, this family of blessing, Abraham's family would be the family of blessing, Jacob's family was anything but. It was a hot mess, like my family and probably like your family a little bit, except even more extreme. And so as we pick up in Genesis chapter 37, we're going to the next section, the last section, the Joseph story. That's where we're going to pick it up this morning, and I think we're going to find an answer to this question. What do we do as followers of Jesus when we're experiencing hostility or experiencing something, maybe it's not hostility, but maybe something that makes you ask the question, God, what are you up to in this in my life? What are we supposed to do with that? Because I think the Joseph story answers that question as we we're in Genesis 37. So this morning we're going to we're going to see that the problem, the problem of hostility, God's people experiencing hostility. We're going to look at the solution that we see in our text. It's kind of a theological solution. And then we're going to look at an application. What do we do with that as we go forward into 2024? So here's the problem. The problem is, and we've, we've seen it in Jesus, we've seen it throughout the Bible, but, but I'm going to restate it here, that God's people often experience hostility. We are not exempted. Though it would be really nice for me to stand up here and say, you know, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for, his life, for your life, and God's plan for you is that your life is going to be easy. And he is going to take all the, all the difficulty, all the hostility, everybody's going to like you wherever you go. That, that's the way it's going to be. Wouldn't that be nice? That'd be a really nice, cozy, warm message, but that is not the message that we have in the Bible. It, it, in fact, the opposite is the case, that God's people often, not always, but they often experience hostility at some point in their lives. Now, why is that? It's because uh, we, serve, we serve God, the, the one who rules everything, but this world is somewhat under the sway of someone else, someone who rebelled against God. Someone who hates God, someone who hates his people, someone who hates the image of God in people. The Bible calls him the devil, the adversary, Satan. And because what, what and who we are comes into conflict with him, there is hostility there towards us. And God's people often experience hostility. Joseph, our boy Joseph this morning, is no exception. Now, he brought it on himself a little bit, as we're going to see uh, in these verses. If you go to verse 3, now Israel, that's Jacob, Jacob, his name was changed to Israel when God wrestled with him at, at the brook. He said, your name's going to be Israel. Now, Israel, Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. This is not supposed to be a, uh, a master class on parenting, but if you're a parent or if you're a boss, favoritism is not a good plan, okay? Don't have favorites, okay? Enough said, but... but uh, so Joseph is the favorite. Why? Because he was the son of his old age. Joseph, in the, the history of Israel's sons, he's the twelfth child. So he came rather late in the game. He's the first son of Jacob's favorite wife. This family a, was a mess. Jacob had a favorite wife. He had, he had two sister wives, and then their servants were kind of sub-wives under them. So he had all these children, 
But Rachel was Jacob's favorite, and Joseph was the son, the first son of Rachel. I think that probably had something to do with it. And so what did he do? He made him a robe of many colors. Now, we've heard this. He made him a robe of many colors. And the implication is that none of the other brothers had the robe. It's not like that Reuben had a robe of many colors, and Judah had a robe of many colors, and Simeon had a robe of many colors, and Gad had... No. Only Joseph had a coat of many colors. So verse 4, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, what did they do? They hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. The words in Hebrew literally have this kind of idea. They couldn't say anything nice about him. They were completely hostile towards Joseph because of their father's favoritism. Verse 6, 5 and 6 as we go, it gets worse. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf rose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. <laughs> the brothers get the point. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So they hate him because his, because his father. If you look at verse 2, they hate him because he's a tattletale. The end of verse 2, Joseph brought a bad report of him to their father. They hate him because he's dad's little uh, tattletale. Dad sends him out to check on them. And he brings back honest reports. You just imagine this, this guy. He's, he's, no one in his family likes him. Right? And then he, he just goes even further. So he's experiencing hostility. What, what comes of this hostility? The chapter kind of divides into two pieces. You have the setup with the dreams and the robe, and then you have what happens after that. Jacob, now just think about this. If you're in a family, and it seems like that one of the kids, none of the other kids like them, and the kids that don't like them, they're bigger and they're older, would you do what Jacob does right here? They're off, uh, they're off watching the sheep probably days away. So what does Jacob do? Jacob sends Joseph on his own to check on his brothers. Not very wise. In verse 18, we pick it up and it says, They saw him, they saw Joseph from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. This is how much they hated Joseph. They just wanted him gone. So they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. That'll teach him. Thankfully, his older brother Reuben, the oldest, he gets involved and says, let's not, let's not kill him. That's a little extreme, guys. Let's not, let's not kill him. Let's not get the blood on our hands. Let's, verse 21, let's not take his life. Let's throw him into a pit in the wilderness and not lay a hand on him. And so that's what they do. They throw him in a pit. Joseph comes. They strip him of his robe. They took him, threw him into a pit, verse 24. And notice the pit was empty and there was no water in it. So they had gone from, we're going to kill him with our own bare hands, whatever that looked like, to we're just going to leave him to die. No food, no water, he can't get out. Then notice verse 25. This is just cold. Verse 25. So they just thrown this guy in the pit, their brother, that they grew up with. They didn't like him, but this is cold. And what do they do? They, they don't even think about it. They sit down to eat. That's a fascinating, fascinating detail. They sit down to eat. They just went on with their day. We're going to consign Joseph to death, and we're just going to sit down to eat and just pretend as if nothing happened. This is how much hostility they had. Reuben's plan was to come back and let him out. But Judah says, hey, let's not, let's not just let him die. Let's, let's make some money off of this. So verse 28, you guys know the story. Midianite traders passed by, they, so they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph 
to Egypt. So the, the brothers go, they return, they take the, the robe, they get blood on it, they take it to Jacob. Jacob's, oh, my, my son is dead. See, Joseph, though he was part of the family of blessing, he was part of God's people. He experienced intense hostility. Now, I would argue he probably brought it on himself. His dad probably brought it on him as well. His brothers were definitely responsible. They were jealous, nasty human beings at this point. No one comes out of this looking good. Well, we see that, that he, as, as a kind of type of God's people, he experienced great hostility. God didn't exempt him from that. God's people often experience hostility. It's not unique to you. It's not unique to me. Maybe you've experienced it personally at work, like I described, or maybe you've experienced it in your family, or maybe you've experienced it in relationships that are broken. And maybe it makes you think like, like I think, like, God, what are you up to? How could you allow this to happen? What's going on in my life? You don't understand the, what's going on on the canvas of your life that God is painting. You can experience it personally. We can experience it corporately. We live in a time and a place, friends, where, where what we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that he has definite things to say about life and how we live, that's not a popular opinion. And Christians have somewhat been pushed to the side and, and mocked for their faith in the public sphere. But we shouldn't be surprised. Because God's people often experience hostility. And that's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have, we have brothers and sisters. I, I saw a thing, I think, from Voice of the Martyrs. 90 plus percent of Christian martyrs were from Nigeria last year. There's just, there, there is persecution going on in our world. Why? Because God's people often experience hostility. And that can make us think, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? Is there, is there something that you're, that you're doing? I don't see it. Well, the story of Joseph speaks to that place. And I think what the story of Joseph says is it says this, God wants to even use that hostility that we're experiencing, that thing that we don't really understand, that we can't like put in a place, that we don't, we don't, we don't know how it's all going to work out in the end. He wants to use even that for his good purpose. For his good purpose. Because if you think about the story, the story of Joseph, if you rewind the tape, if you know, know what's going on in Genesis, what happens if Jacob doesn't have a favorite wife? Like, like all these dominoes just lined up. Jacob has this favorite wife, Rachel, and that, that introduces this rivalry between Rachel and Leah. And then, and then because Rachel can't get pregnant right away, like she, she gives Jacob her servant. And so there's kids from another woman, and then Leah stops having children, so she gives her servant to Jacob. So now there's these four women that are all having uh, children with this one man. So there's this mixed family, and there's jealousy between the brothers. And Jacob, what, what happens if Jacob treated them all the same instead of giving Joseph a coat of many colors? What if all the boys had a coat of many colors? Do we see that through this whole thing, there's thing after thing after thing after thing, and, and God, it was, we're going to see in a minute, he wants to use even these things for his good purpose. To go back to Genesis chapter 12, this is his purpose. This is his promise to Abraham, that in you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. He like to think God's purpose is about me and, and what he's doing in my life and my comfort and my, uh, <clears throat> what's, what I can see. That's where the big questions come in, because what, I don't understand what's going on on the canvas. But he says, this is his purpose. In, in you, in the family of Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. So we have to put Joseph in that context and understand it in that context. And if you, I don't have this on the screen, but if you look, there's, there's a little foreshadowing of this in verse 36. 
of chapter 37, because after Jacob mourns, after Israel mourns for Joseph, it says this, meanwhile, the Midianites, so, so now there's this split screen thing going on. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him, Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So from here on out, there's going to be things that are going on in Egypt, and then there's going to be things that are going on in Canaan. And it's a little foreshadowing of what God is going to do. And, and what we're going to see is that Joseph's, the suffering and hostility that Joseph endured was necessary for the purposes of God. It was necessary. All the things that, that happened after wouldn't have come had not Joseph's brothers hated him so much that they wanted to kill him. So they threw him in a pit and then they decided to sell him to Egypt. It was necessary. It was necessary in Genesis 45 when Joseph's brothers see who Joseph is. Finally, we're going we're gonna to get there in a few weeks. Joseph says, come near to me, please. And they came near. I'm your brother Joseph. And then he says, verse 5, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. He's speaking to them decades after they sold him into slavery. He says, don't be distressed or angry with yourselves. Why? Because you sold me here. But God sent me before you to preserve life. So all of, the, all of this story, this nasty story, what, what is going on here? We just see human hands and the brothers are treating him terrible. But what did he say? He said, God was in it. God sent me here. Why? So that I could preserve life. Because what God could see that no one else could see was on the horizon. There was this terrible famine. And he needed a person there who could have influence to preserve the lives of, of, ever, of the known world. Not only them, but in verse 7, he says, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth. So not only the, the world at its time, but also you and your family. So in sending Joseph, selling Joseph to Egypt, they were planting the seeds of their own salvation from starvation. Now that doesn't just boggle the mind. To think that our God is able to take this hostile situation that Joseph endured and through it to save the very people who were being hostile to him. It was necessary. I think it was necessary for another reason. Because if you go back to verse 3 of chapter 37, we get a picture of, of Joseph now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. You can imagine a 17-year-old who's been kind of pampered and favored his whole life. Is that 17-year-old ready to do the things that are necessary to save the world of his day? I would say they probably, he probably didn't have the character. He'd probably never been through anything difficult. He'd probably never done anything really hard. Maybe he'd never had to uh, endure. So it was necessary that he be in that position, but it was also necessary so that God could form his character so that he could be the type of person who could do what needed to be done. Well, friends, what if the hostility that we suffer is necessary too? I think it was necessary in the case of Joseph. But what if it's necessary for us too? I love this, this verse in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. Paul says this. this it doesn't make sense until we start to like pan out and, and think of this in, in broader terms. But he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice when people are hostile to us, knowing that that, that produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love is important to our hearts. So here Paul is saying that these difficult things, hostility from other people, God is determined to take it, even, even though it's, it feels nasty. And he wants to use it to make us into the kind of people that he wants us to be. And so Paul says this wild thing, we can rejoice in it. I don't think Joseph was rejoicing. 
It's very difficult to rejoice in our sufferings, but Paul is trying to give us that kind of perspective. So maybe it's necessary for that, but we just got done with our sermon series on Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, we find this. It says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you do not grow weary or faint-hearted. So what if, what if, what if this, what if the hostility that we experience is necessary so that our endurance not only builds our character, but also is a model and example for others to follow? What if the hostility that you and I experience in life and the way we go through it in faith, holding God's hand, is one of the means by which God helps other people persevere through their own hostility? What if those people would grow weary or faint-hearted if it weren't for, for the example of Jesus and for the example of other people in their life? See, what we see is that God wants to use even the hostility that we experience for His good purposes. So what do we do? What do we do with this when I ask that question? I, th- I think this, when, when we are experiencing hostility, when we're asking the question, God, what are you up to? I don't understand. I believe it, but I have no idea what it looks like. What if we were to look for his good, purposeful hand? We're to look for his good, purposeful hand, even in the midst of of the hostility that we are experiencing. There's a couple interesting things in the Joseph story. Uh, There's a bunch of interesting things. In verse 18, it says this, They saw him from afar, and before he came to them, they conspired against him to kill him. And you know that all of Scripture points to Jesus. And so in Matthew chapter 26, we read the chief priests and the elders, they gathered together and they plotted together. Why? In order to arrest Jesus by stealth and what? And kill him. See, Joseph is a type. He's a type of the innocent, and he's not innocent, as we've seen. He's not, he's not this pristine, nice kid who did everything right and just kind of fell into the situation. He's kind of an annoying little brat. His brothers were probably not totally wrong in thinking he had something coming. But he points to one who is a perfect, innocent sufferer. The Lord Jesus. Not, not only that, but... But in verse 28, we read about what happens. The Midianites travelers, they passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and what? They sold him for 20 shekels of silver. That's fascinating because over in Matthew, Matthew 26, Judas sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now, Joseph went as a slave, even though he probably was, he was way worse than Jesus. He wasn't perfect. Jesus went to his death. Why did he go to his death? So that he could prove God's heart towards you and towards me. See, if you're ever asking the question, God, what are you doing in my life? I don't understand it. Why do I have to experience this hostility? Why does nobody like me? Why am I misunderstood? We can look at what God did for us in Jesus. We can look at the man hanging on the cross and we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's heart towards us is for our good and that he withheld nothing to save us. And if he would hold, withhold nothing to save us, don't you think that he wants to use even the hostility, even the, the pain, even the hard things in our life for his good purposes? He gave his son up for us. Certainly he wants to redeem those things in your life. If God could use 
enslavement in Egypt in Joseph's life. If God could use the biggest injustice that's ever been perpetrated in this world, that a, a totally innocent one, everybody knew he was innocent, experienced a terrible death on the cross. Everyone left him. Friend, he's certainly able to use the hostility and the problems and the pain in your life for his purposes and his good. So look for God's good, purposeful hand. Look for God's good, purposeful hand this week. I'd encourage you, look back at the Joseph story. If you don't have a Bible reading plan in the new year, just go to Genesis 37. Maybe you want to put it next to Matthew chapter 26 and 27. I mean, there's some pretty stark comparisons there. And maybe you just want to meditate this week on how God was at work in Joseph's story and how God was at work in the story of Jesus, even though both of them in the moment probably uh, had questions. But that's one way, look in His Word for His hand. Another way, uh, <clears throat> I'm doing something, I'm going to offer it to you. We're calling it the Hebrews 11 Challenge. I forgot mine, it's right over there, I think. But, uh, Wayne, well, does anybody have one of the little Hebrews books? We'll see if we can get them. Yeah, just unpack all that stuff. Oh, Jerry's got one. Look at this guy. Thanks, Jerry. Sorry about that, guys. I was in my coat. Thanks, Lisa. So, we got, we've got these. We have hundreds of them that we printed off, and it's just got Hebrews chapter 11 in there. Okay, there's 40 verses. Last year, we, we went through the book of Hebrews, and one of the things I said was, man, wouldn't it be cool if you would memorize Hebrews 11? There's 52 weeks in a year. There's 40 chapters, or 40 verses in here. So you could do one verse a week. And I'll tell you, there's nothing, very little, I don't, I, can't, I don't know if I could say nothing, but there's very little in my life that I've ever done that helps me get through difficult times, times where I'm wondering what God is doing, than memorizing the Scripture. And Hebrews chapter 11 is chock full of people who had difficulties, who had hostility. And we would love for you this year, you know, we're not going to check up on you. Uh, if you. If you do it and you tell us you did it, we're going to give you something. I checked with the finance team. A couple weeks ago I said we could give you a sports, sports car. The finance team said, I can't give you a sports car. I'm sorry. I wanted to, but it was the finance team. They told me it was their fault. Just kidding. Uh, they, they did, I didn't even ask them. But, um, but we, we're thinking about a t-shirt, we're thinking about some kind of hat or, or something that has to do with this, but that's not the deal. The deal is put this in your mind so that when you have questions, you'll be easily able to go back to what God has said in His Word. It'll be in your heart. You can pick those up in the lobby there around the church, but we'd love for you to do that with us. But that's a way for you, when you're going through difficulty, to look for God's good, purposeful hand. See, I would imagine this year, friend, you are going to experience hostility. There's going to be things in your life that make you wonder, God, what are you up to? But the story of Joseph, Joseph, points to the story of Jesus, which assures us, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God wants to use those things in our world, in our family, in us, and for the benefit of others, Amen. for His glory, and ultimately for our joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the story of Joseph. Thank you that it's recorded here in Scripture for us. I would, I would ask for myself and for my brothers and sisters that we would be people who, no matter what's going on in our life, we would see your hand, or that we would trust in your goodness, or that even in the midst of hostility from other people in this world, or we would know that you were at work, or that you would show yourself faithful. Lord, I would lift up anyone here who is just uh, broken. Because of hostility that's been aimed at them. 
Lord, that you would come to them and you would strengthen them and you would comfort them and you would give them your hope. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.